You know, I have one I have one question I want to ask you, which is it's really important. We have the provost offices under Larry's leadership monitoring class availability, but how, on the ground, how does it look to you? I mean, are you not getting into the classes that you? Or is is it delaying people? How how does it how does it look uh, in terms of you know you need to take a prerequisite in your major, and all of a sudden it's filled, and you have to wait to the next quarter or semester to do it. Um, well, at UC Santa Cruz, for example, it's not looking too slow. Like um, a couple weeks ago, um, about 200 psychology majors tried to enroll in their senior seminar, which they need to graduate for next quarter, but there were only 70 spots open. And so, um, I'm not sure if I'm getting this correctly, but I think some of the professors were going to volunteer to like offer, I'm not sure if they would be paid extra, but like offer to teach extra classes. Um, the director of the program asked the professors to try to um, pay well, and they're not sure that they'll be uh, paid for their time until later. So they um, made space for the 200 students, but they're all fourth years and if they hadn't gotten their senior seminar, they wouldn't have graduated on time and they would all have had to take a leave of absence or pay tuition for a quarter for classes that weren't going towards their degrees. So it's not just an issue on getting prereqs, but it's like an issue all the way through. Okay. The, uh, most of the campuses have, in the midst of their terrible budget situation, have, in, have set aside a small amount of money to pick at targets of opportunity when you suddenly run into a situation where psychology is way oversubscribed. They can ascribe some money to help that, and then the next quarter it will be a different target. Uh, I think they are seriously trying to manage the class size availability uh, really well, and, I, and it's done differently from different campuses. UCLA has undertaken a process to sort of get the, the number of courses required for graduation down to a smaller number than it used to be back in the old days, and the professor would show up and add a course that would kind of become a requirement. That That's all being seriously looked at to make sure that the core material that's needed for a major is mastered, but that there's a little bit of time either to go deeper in an area or to broaden and become a major in it. So I think serious efforts are trying to address these problems because length and time degree would really be a bad outcome. Yes, yeah. so I would recommend that to you. Again, if I were on campus, I think the students ought to be with the divisional senate people and all that <coughs> and say, look, only the faculty determines what you need to know as a psych major or whatever. But, uh, you know, over time, you know, some of, like in UCLA, some of these, uh, you know, majors, you know, the, they had like 50 credits or something like that. And UCLA has managed to reduce uh, quite a few of these majors by seven credits. Well, that's a big deal to students. It makes it much more possible. So, and, and this is really outside of my power of the chancellors, but you know, the curriculum always needs to be re-examined because you know, they tend to be barnacles. You know, things get attached and periodically you just need to look at it and see, you know, have we put too much of a burden on the students? Do we really need all these courses? And the faculty has to figure out what you really need to know when you graduate in that area. And that's a good question for students to ask. Um, it comes up oftentimes in engineering, as you probably all know. That's probably the most crowded curriculum we have for the graduates. Um, what else is a concern on campus? Um, oh, I mean, what do you think of the on your campus, I mean, obviously everyone's worried about tuition and everyone's worried about what the state government's going to do. But what, what are the other issues? You know, one, one concern that, uh, I'm not far down this year, I'm the editor of the Daily Bruin. Um, one concern that a reader raised to us uh, on our Facebook two weeks back is, you know, at a time when, when we're seeing, you know, courses getting cut, majors getting um, tightened, uh, and <coughs> tuition going up, you know, we're walking to campus and we're seeing all sorts of instruction all over the place. And we're seeing that with money that's being donated to the university um, for those specific purposes. And students understand that the money needs to go there. And they understand that that's the only way it can be. But it still makes students uneasy to see that. Um, and, and they're curious to know, you know, what does the leadership have to say about that? Well. Uh, you know, what, I mean, you can look at it as good news or bad news, but uh, probably uh, somewhere in between, but um, uh, we're getting very little money from the state for capital projects. I mean, they're broke. 
And so what you're seeing, uh, maybe it's not a satisfactory answer, and I understand the student concern, is projects that were being planned, you know, and for which bonds were issued and the proceeds of the bonds can't be spent on anything else. So, but it might have been three, four years ago that that happened, so it predates the, the Great Recession. So you're seeing some of that play out. The second thing is, I, you know, I, I don't do much fundraising now, but I used to in the past, and, um, uh, you know, donors are not always putty in your hands. If someone says, well, why did you accept an oil painting, or why did you put up this new pavilion? Well, we have needs for scholarships, student services, and all the rest of it. There's a lot of donors, 90-some percent of our, all our um, uh, gifts and, and, and uh, endowments are restricted. So donors come to us, and, and by the way, sometimes that favors the students. They may come in and say, I really want a scholarship program, or I want graduate student stipend. Other times they'll come in and say, I'm really issue, interested in nanotechnology, I want to have a chair in that, or, uh, and so forth. So, the, the, you know, I, I, th I think I agree that, you know, we are so desperate for operating funds, where the donor is flexible, we ought to pump very hard for two things. One is to get as much of the money now, rather than an endowment. You give a million dollars, it only pays back 50000 a year, but it does it forever. Um, and, um, and the other is uh, to try to get them uh, to, to donate more to our operating expenses. I have to tell you the truth, though, sometimes it's a very tough sell because people come in and they have had careers and, and things that interest them along the way, uh, or, you know, they have statements that they're willing, they want to make with their money, and, you know, they, they really do want a new computer science building and they're just not going to move the money over to, to the art museum. That's just not in, in the cards. So that's the only explanation I can give you. It's, it's slowed down greatly. And, um, but donors are very independent-minded. There are actually relatively few cases where we can absolutely direct them from one area to another because they graduated from engineering or law or business or whatever. But the same thing works against the humanities because the, the, the graduates of the professional schools tend to be more affluent. Some of them do give to liberal arts humanities, but many of them say, no, no, I want to chair in real estate law or I want to chair in finance and business school. That's another area, though, <coughs> excuse me, that we are working with the state to try to accelerate some of our construction projects that have been approved by the state and are, are critical. Uh, I mean, Merced is probably the, the best example. The biggest constraint on Merced's growth is buildings, academic buildings. And you know, one of those is being held up because the state is not issuing bonds right now. So we're looking at ways that we can use our credit and our balance sheet to accelerate those projects as long as we have a sufficient guarantee from the state that they will come in and take it out when their you know, fiscal condition has improved. I have a uh, <coughs> request to the students or some for you to consider in your, as you write about some of this. And, and it has to do with sort of long range down with support of the university by alumni. If you go back to any of the privates and so forth, the students in their later lives are very wedded to the university that they came from. Uh, Jesse Chang, the current student regent, has been meeting across the campuses to try to generate interest in students in, during their career, senior students to start to think about joining alumni association almost in advance, or student associations that become alumni, to foster an increasing sense of gratitude and obligation of students back to the University of California. That, you know, just, if we could do that to a greater degree, then we could call on these alumni when the university's in trouble, we need to support the legislature, even a small financial contribution Five dollars, ten dollars, whatever. Even if you say I want it to go into student aid only, so it's really going back to students. There are a bunch of ways to structure it, but I think engendering a feeling of uh, sort of oneness with the university among students would be an enormously beneficial thing. And I think you know, as editorial writers and news writers, that's something that you could explore on your campus. 